If you would like to support the channel, then please turn off adblock and refresh the page. Alternatively, use the link in the description below to donate to T1 Patreon. Thank you. Hello Magic Community on YouTube, I'm T1 Glistenrelf. First of all, shoutouts to Rudy from Alpha Investments for letting me know about something that I didn't realize was even happening. You may be aware if you play or follow the Pokemon TCG, that Roaring Skies is getting another print run. Now, that's a big deal for a number of reasons, but I think that the most popular, the most emblematic of these, is the card Shaman EX. And I promise I am getting into a magic-related point. Uh, give me just a minute for it, alright? So, Shaman EX is the kind of card, if you know nothing about Pokemon, let me try to explain it, because I used to play the game, but this has been quite a while <laughs> since I have. It fits into any deck that wants to play it. It's crazy card advantage. Uh, use it, burn up the resources in your hand, and then fill back up to six cards. And because of its uh, attack, you can bring it back. Sly something or other. Uh, you can bring it back to your hand to repeat this process. It's actually a really sick card. And it's an expensive card. Uh, because it hasn't been printed in that many. I mean, it's not... It's extremely rare just within the set itself, and it's not the kind of card that received four million printings. It's not Birds of Paradise. And so, it doesn't have the supply to meet the demand, so the price for it's actually pretty high. Or at least it was. Again, Roaring Skies, the set it was printed in originally, is getting a reprint. And so, as you'd imagine, the price of Shaman EX dropped. If you remember not too long ago, Eternal Masters was announced to have a similar second print run, just recently. If you're playing Magic or Pokemon for the purpose- if you're buying cards for the purpose of playing, this is what you want. If you're a collector, this is exactly the opposite of what you want. That dichotomy itself is what separates Magic the Gathering from a lot of the other card games, or at least it did until recently, right? Magic, famously or infamously, depending on how you look at it, has a reserve list. If you have a card that's on the reserve list, you have the promise of the company, you have Wizards of the Coast promise that that will never be printed again with without online being an exception, and they used to have an exception for promo cards, but not anymore. Say, Karn Silver Golem, for instance, received this. But other than Magic the Gathering Online, if you have a Black Lotus, there won't be any more, so because the supply never goes up, the price should never go down. That's how it should work, right? However, that's, if, that's from a collector's standpoint. And we've talked about players, we've talked about collectors, those are pretty obvious. But what isn't talked about enough is the point of view of Wizards of the Coast, or just any trading card game company. First and foremost, they're a business, and we'd like to think that they're looking out for players' interest, and they are, indirectly. You know, I, I'm gonna be a little bit of a cynic, but I think this makes a lot of sense. The company's first purpose is to make money, and the means to that end is pleasing the players. But it's not just pleasing the players, it's pleasing the collectors, too. A lot of people that play just for the sake of the game itself may not understand this, but why is it that companies like Wizards of the Coast caters to collectors so much? You, when you think of that right off the bat, you might think, well, wait a minute, they're not the ones buying the cards. And yeah, you're kind of right, if you're thinking about just the singles market, you're kind of right. Once a card's uh, print run is, is done, once you're not, uh, say, Cons of Tarkir, for instance, uh, once you don't have any more Jeskai Ascendancies being printed, it doesn't matter how many they buy off the singles market, that doesn't directly affect Wizards. As long as the card's in print, you could make the case it does help them because it means more packs are being cracked, etc. If you're a company like Wizards of the Coast, you make your money not just off of the sale of singles, uh, but also of cases and boxes. And collectors, including collectors that run game stores, can buy up those boxes. 
And that's one way that Wizards of the Coast makes additional money, makes more profit. And that's a good thing, you think, right? Because it means that, let's say that a collector goes and buys a hundred boxes of something, uh, Eternal Masters or Roaring Skies. You would think that that means that eventually, when they do end up selling them, there will be a greater supply of the cards that you want. There is a bit of a delay on that because they're going to spectate on those. They're going to hold the cards back, the boxes and cases back, in order to wait for their value to rise. That is true. But there is a, uh, there's a counter-argument to that, which is that in order to make that work, they have to make the print run uh, stop artif- I guess all print runs stop artificially. They, they're cut short artificially. Otherwise, you would have an unlimited print run, which Magic the Gathering has tried before with unlimited. It didn't last for very long. <laughs> they eventually, of course, had to limit that. Imagine if you could get an unlimited number of Black Lotuses. Now, directly, though, it's the players that end up making more money for the company. If you want to talk about the largest card game in the world, and I'm not talking about the largest by players, or number of tournaments, or anything like that, or community size. I'm talking about just strictly the number of cards in circulation. Well, we actually have a measure for what the largest card game in the world is, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. It's not Magic the Gathering. You might think that, because it's the oldest one that's still going, at least. But no, it's another one. It's Yu-Gi-Oh! Now, Yu-Gi-Oh! is not, as far as I'm aware, the largest card game in the United States or in North America, but around the world, it absolutely is. And I wouldn't be surprised if it is here in the States too. And the reason for that is because this is a company that embraces the reprint. There is no reserve list in this game. This is a game that, yeah, the, the cards will be expensive when they're first released. Give them about a year and that won't be the case any longer. Konami, and formerly Upper Deck Entertainment, has a liberal reprint policy because they know that that means that they'll end up selling more cards. Uh, they had, uh, let me give a little bit of background. In Magic the Gathering, we had a set called Chronicles. It was our reprint set. It was the first modern masters, if you will. It reprinted a number of cards that had gotten awfully expensive, not like your Black Lotuses, but Blood Moon, for instance, was reprinted. Collectors hated this. <laughs> uh, players liked it, of course, because it meant that you could get those cards you couldn't get your hands on before. And without it, you might not have had Magic the Gathering as we know it today, because the player base was shrinking. But collectors didn't like that, and they needed some assurance that this wasn't going to ruin their investments. Otherwise, at least in the short term, that meant that the game would make less money. And you would have, yeah, I mean, sometimes collectors are players in the game because it's a good investment. In other words, you may not want to invest in the game as a player unless you can also use it as an investment. So that's a draw as well. So for those reasons, Wizards of the Coast said, we'll make you this promise. Here's the reserve list. We're never going to do that again. And they've kept to it ever since. I give you that context because in the game Yu-Gi-Oh, they had a similar crisis, actually. Their problem was with, I think it was either Dark Beginnings or Dark Revelation. Unfortunately, I've forgotten which came first. Uh, but it was their Chronicles. And when they faced the same exact backlash, you know what they did? They doubled down. Not even a year later, they came out with the sequel to that reprint set. And as a result, investors left the game. Period. If you want to invest in a card game, Yu-Gi-Oh! is not the one to do. I'm just letting you know now. They will reprint your cards. If they don't reprint your cards, it's because they think that nobody wants them. There's probably a reason for that. Now, they won't happen in no time flat, but it will eventually happen. Give it a year, maybe a bit longer, and your card will be reprinted. That's one reason why an archetype that can cost more than a thousand dollars now will cost, a, I don't want to say nothing, I don't want to say pocket change, but it will cost a lot less later on. It's because Yu-Gi-Oh! has had, uh, not counting structure decks, not counting 
star packs, <laughs> not counting anything like that, they have on average about a reprint set every year. And they're not these teeny tiny print runs either. This is something that is what makes Yu-Gi-Oh! I, I, I don't want to argue about which is a better game. I like Yu-Gi-Oh! I like Magic the Gathering. I like them for different reasons. They're apples and oranges to me. I actually very much like that comparison. But Yu-Gi-Oh! and Magic are very different in this one respect. Yu-Gi-Oh! is a game that wants, or rather Konami is a company, that wants to get those cards into the player's hands as quickly and easily as possible because it makes them the most money and increases the size of the player base. Magic the Gathering has sort of the opposite approach, I suppose. We want to get these cards in as many people's hands as possible. Asterisk. We, we want to make as much money as we can, but we want to please our collectors too because we think that that's also a good in investment for us, I suppose is a good way of putting it. It looks, though, that Magic the Gathering is starting to change. Just a bit, just a bit. But when Eternal Masters, Eternal Masters, is getting another print run, that, to me, says that something is changing. When Pokemon, which, by the way, is owned by the same parent company, is getting another print run for Roaring Skies, that tells me that something is changing. For the better, I think as a player. Now, as a collector, I imagine that that's not what I would think, but as a player, that's exactly what I want. I, as a, uh, as a modern player in Magic, as a legacy player in Magic, I want there to be more people against whom I can compete, against whom I can practice and try out new decks and whatnot. I love that, and if you've seen me play EDH or Vintage or Legacy lately on the channel, you've probably seen proxies, and that's because those formats are just awfully expensive to get into. EDH less so, but uh, I guess it depends on how competitive you want to be. <sighs> well, that little itty bitty teeny tiny history lesson aside, I say all of that to say this, I want Magic the Gathering to succeed. I want it to go the way that Yu-Gi-Oh! has gone in that one respect, in reprints. I don't know that that's anything that's ever actually going to happen, but I can be optimistic because we've seen what it's done to a game like Yu-Gi-Oh! The profit motive is there, and the incent what I mean is the incentive is there. Yu-Gi-Oh! sells, um, usually, depends on the set, but usually, nine cards per pack, and only one of those is a rare. Now, in Magic, you get more cards per pack, and there are more rarities. There's the common, uncommon, and rare mythic. And Yu-Gi-Oh! is still selling more cards. Think about that for a moment. That means that they've had to sell way more packs in order for that to be the case. Alright. Anyway, those are just my thoughts on it. Again, shoutouts to Rudy from Alpha Investments for making a video that brought this to my attention. I can understand where he's coming from. He's a collector. He's in Magic Investment, in Magic Finance, and other games as well. If I had a, a vested interest, if I were in his position, I don't know what I would think. <laughs> I, granted, he hasn't bought any Roaring Skies prior to this, but if something like this happened with a set that he does have a bunch of, I can imagine. I don't even though I'm the kind of person that wants them to print as many cards as possible, because I, I'm a player first and foremost and I want more players in the game, I don't feel good when something like this happens to an investor. I don't know why anyone would. I just would like the game to change in this way because I want the game to grow. That's all. That's all it is. And it's unfortunate that it has to hurt collectors. But I think for the community as a whole, it's probably a good thing if it does. Anyway, I, I hope I got my point across well enough, and I'm sorry if that last part didn't sound very nice. I don't mean it to be rude. I really don't. I appreciate the work that people like Rudy do, and I mean, I can understand where people are coming from when they want to invest in games like these. I just don't agree. 
Anyway, take care, Magic Community. I will see you later. Bye-bye.